petition for help in front of the jail security camera, but no one came. City officials agreed to pay Kate Hammer $750,000 to settle his case, and Kate Hammer hopes that by going public, he'll force the police station to change its procedures. If you get in trouble in front of a jail and you can't get help. I know. If you're they're not watching the security cameras at the jails, where are they? Right. So, oh, I mean, geez. imagine if they'd actually been in a place where there was no security. Well, but that's, uh, so there you have it. And of course, Everything you do in life these days, as you know, Rich, is it's on videotape. On camera. So don't, don't do camera. anything you don't want everybody to see, <laughs> or it'll be in the G block of Hannity and Cohen. Rich, good to see you. Thanks, Alan. Good job once again sitting Take in care. for Sean. That is all the time we have left for tonight. We thank Rich Lowry for being here this evening. Greta Van Susteren is here to go on the record. Thank you for watching us, and have a great night. This is a Fox News alert. A pre-dawn airstrike in Pakistan killed at least 17 people. The target? The number two man in Al-Qaeda, Ayman al-Zawahiri. Steve Santani is live in Washington with the details. Steve? Greta, U.S. officials tell Fox News Ayman al-Zawahiri was the target of a U.S. attack in Pakistan Friday, but it's not yet known if he was among those killed in the pre-dawn strike. Zawahiri has long been a U.S. target in the war on terror. He's Osama bin Laden's right-hand man and has been known to hide out in the same tribal regions where the strike took place. U.S. officials say there was good intelligence. He was in the area at the time of today's attack. Witnesses report an attack in the village of Damadola in western Pakistan killed at least 17 people and wounded several others. There were reports that a series of explosions was heard from miles around and that three homes were destroyed. It happened not far from the Afghanistan border. Now, officials are not confirming or denying that a Predator drone aircraft was used in this attack. The unmanned airplane is operated by the CIA, not the U.S. military, and it's capable of locating a target and launching Hellfire missiles. U.S. and Pakistani officials are working together at this hour to determine exactly who was killed in that attack. Greta? Steve, thank you. And tonight, we are live in Miami, Florida, where just hours ago, the brilliance of the sea set sail on another voyage, but not before we brought our cameras to the ship and retraced the steps of George Smith IV and his new bride, Jennifer. It was more than six months ago when the newlyweds embarked on their honeymoon cruise. They left together, but George never returned. Bill Wright, Royal Caribbean Senior Vice President of Fleet Operations, took us first to the casino where the honeymooners were gambling that night. And what, do you have any idea what the, uh, what the, is this a 24-7 casino? No, no, we, uh, absolutely not. What's the schedule like? Let's take, let's walk around and take a look at it. What's sure. the schedule like? Well, the schedule is typically the casino's open when the ship's at sea. Uh, when we come into port because of local reg regulations in whatever country we're visiting, uh, the casino typically has to remain closed. Alcohol is served in the casino? Alcohol is served in the casino. Security cameras? Security cameras. Uh, do you have any idea where the night of July 4th into July 5th were... Um, George Smith was. In the My casino. understanding is that they were uh, fond of playing both blackjack and craps. Where's the blackjack table? So right over here. So here are the blackjack tables. Probably he was someplace here during the evening. Somewhere in this area here, you have poker, blackjack. Right here's the blackjack, and then you have the craps table over on the uh, on the other side. Any idea what hours that he was likely here playing? Again, my understanding is is that they were here relatively late. Relatively late. Right. Is that uh, past uh, the midnight on the fourth and into the I think the it's fifth? in the midnight, the midnight hours. Do you know what the hours were? Uh, how, you know uh, whether it's open or not uh, all night long that night. Not all night long, because again the ship was coming into port at 6:30. So typically, uh, but we can find that out for you. But I would guess that the casino might have shut down at one o'clock or two o'clock. At what point do you become sort of subject to Turkish laws? Because you're coming to the Turkish port. Um, when does when do the Turkish laws pick up? Typically at three nautical miles. That's the uh, normal uh, boundary of territorial waters. Any known trouble here that night on the night of fourth into the fifth uh, in the casino? Not that I'm aware of. Now, Not George, aware of. George Smith apparently was with um, four other people, or with several mm -hmm. other people. But, you know, that's in subject to dispute. Do you know if he was with them in the casino? That I do not know specifically. Was he, did he go from the, the casino to the disco or the disco to the casino that night? Again, the, the exact uh, motions of, of, of George that evening, I, I, I don't have that. Mm -hmm. I know he was in the casino and I know he, he was in the discotheque. There are more than 97 cameras on board. Absolutely. Right? Can, okay, more than 97 cameras. 97 tapes were apparently turned over. Mm -hmm. How does that number come about? I mean, explain that to Well, me. that's the physical number. Again, the, the closed circuit television cameras that are throughout the vessel that are going through a multiplexing recording system, which means it's cycling through 
a series of cameras and taking snapshots and then returning to the first camera so that you have a continuous record and that that information is recorded on a VHS tape and we turned over 97 of these VHS tapes to the FBI. This is the disco? This is the disco up on deck 13. Um, let's take a walk around. Sure. Alcohol no doubt served in the disco? Absolutely. Uh, where is the bar? Oh it's over here. Bar's Here's over here. Just, yeah, circular bar. Drinking age on, on board? Drinking age on board is 18. And that's determined by what law? That's determined by international law. And uh, however, that's why I was mentioning earlier that when we're in port, the, um, the bars are obviously closed. So this is the disco exit that uh, Jennifer Hagel Smith came right. out on the early morning hours of July 5th. Do you know about what time she left the disco? About 3.25 in the morning. So the disco closes at 2.30. Is that just the last call? That's the last it, call. So but you're free to sit there and, and finish up your drink. So the, about 3.25 she left. Do they ever lock the doors and throw everybody out? Or is this just sort of now no, open? It, it's just it's the, open, the liquor right. is over. Even in the daytime right now when it's closed, a guest to come up and sit, read a book. It's a nice place to be. All right, 3.25. So then a, a crew member and apparently a passenger saw her go to one, this uh, elevator I think bank. It was actually this elevator right here. So this even this particular elevator she went down? Yes. Um, and so... All right, and what? Uh, well, Her cabin was on deck nine. And and when she was found in the hall, was that in the hall on on deck nine? That was in the in the corridor on deck nine. Okay, so. Thing was, as we understand, is that when she came out on deck nine, she should have turned to the left to go to her cabin, and she apparently turned to the right. All right, now she should have gone. Nine. She should have gone. She should have gone to the left. All right, instead she went to instead the right. Instead she went to the right. All right, well it sort of looks the same, uh, even if you've. Uh, not had anything to drink. Right. This oh. is the corridor she's walking in. Okay. Okay. And we're getting here now. Then she took a right-hand turn here. So she might have realized there was a problem here. Right. And we found her in this corner, um, sitting uh, up against the uh, the bulkhead and the door. What's behind? It says crew this is, only. This is, a, this is a crew only area. Ah. It's open, but she obviously didn't open it. Right. Was that lead to crew quarters? Crew quarters, and crew areas, crew elevators, service elevators for the show. So she's just sitting here. Just sitting here, asleep. Um, I guess so the maintenance see. crew found her here, immediately called security. Security came on the scene, contacted the medical facility, was in walkie-talkie contact with the nurse on duty. She said, okay, we have a guest. She appears to be sleeping. Well, the nurse said, we'll try to wake her up. They attempted that by touching her in the shoulder, and she immediately awoke. She was conversant and said that she was actually okay. Did she, I, I take it she gave her name at that point? or my Whether path? she, I would assume so. Because she must have, I mean, she, in order we, to find we, out where we, she had to go. Right, so either, either she told us, which I would assume is the case, or they used her, her, her access card. But that does, actually does not even have the room number on it, so that wouldn't have been the case. They, she would have to have told them. Her access card have her name on it or just a... Uh, has, okay. has a name but no cabin number. Uh, I mean, it looks like she came to the a dead end right here. I mean, she, she made a turn and there was no place else to go. She made a turn and sat down and, and fell asleep. Uh, because even that door's a little bit right. heavy and, and so... Uh, so then the security staff, we were arranging to have somebody go look at her cabin, go to her cabin, see if anybody was there that could perhaps come and help her, uh, escort her back to the cabin. In the meantime, while that's going on, the crew, the security staff, walked her down. She was walking herself. Not in a wheelchair? Not in a wheelchair at this point. Okay. Walking herself down to the, um, to the end of this corridor where we again sat her down, waiting for the security guards to come back from her cabin came back and said nobody's there at that point the wheelchair had arrived and we took her to her cabin in the wheelchair do you know where the wheelchair uh, picked her up the wheelchair picked her up at the end of this corridor here why if she was walking did she need a wheelchair or was she more impaired uh, and she really should have had one from the get-go sort of or I mean, why the wheelchair i think they just wanted to get her out of that predicament that corner right there get her closer to her cabin closer to the elevators and the wheelchair obviously had to be accessed, so by the time the wheelchair got up, they had moved her down to, um, to this area here. And, and she was willing to get in the wheelchair? And, and she was willing to, to get in the wheelchair, yes. And again, stating that she was okay. Coming up, what did they find when they got back to the room? We're going to take you inside the actual cabin the Smith stayed in. Does that room hold the answer to George Smith's fate? And later, one of the young men who had partied with the Smiths came forward the morning George disappeared. Did he say something that now tips us off as to what might have happened? That's coming up.
At 4 o'clock in the morning on July 5th, Jennifer Hagel Smith was found asleep or unconscious on the floor in a hall far from her own cabin. Ship security put her in a wheelchair and took her to her own cabin. When they got to her cabin, her husband George was not there. Today we took our cameras into their cabin. So we, we had located Jennifer, security was with her, in contact with the medical facility. In the meantime, we sent other security staff to come to the cabin and to see if anybody was here. Why? I mean, no, because we felt that if there was an occupant, a husband, perhaps, that it would be more appropriate for the husband to, be, to come get her. To be her, oh, I get for it. him to come and, and escort her back to the cabin. So, so they have. So they, they they came. They knocked. No answer. They went into the cabin. Probably a very quick visit because all they're looking for is is, is somebody here. It's not very. So big. probably said hello. Probably looked in the in the, uh, the wash closet, and and left. The second time they came in, just before 5 o'clock, with Jennifer, they came in, obviously turned on the lights, put Jennifer onto the top of the bed, and left. So that would have been a, a somewhat longer um, visit. So they don't even tuck her in, they, they just say, no, they just put her um, in her clothes, that, her that was the bed. appropriate thing to do. She was again saying she's okay, put her on top of the bed, and left the room. Um, is there a turn down service um, likely? I mean, I, yes, I, this, is, this is the way the, the bed would this look. Is the bay, bed would have looked that evening. And then they turn off the lights or don't turn off the lights, and they leave. Yeah, I'm not sure whether they left the lights on or not. I, I really don't know. I probably would guess they would have turned them off. Did was it known at that time, if you know, that she was traveling with with someone else? Not well. Obviously, the ship's manifest would indicate that she was traveling with her with her uh, spouse. But would the, was would there be then be an effort to go find him, or is this like you know button it up and it's quiet? Not There's at, no not, problem. We're not still at this point. There was nothing to indicate that anything was amiss. People, even though it's early in the morning, people are up and about around the ship. Even though the casinos closed and the discos closed, people do hang. They walk on the outer deck, so the ship is not completely quiet. People are up and about, so that if she was with, and that was the case with the uh, with her husband. Uh, the fact that he was not here would not necessarily be something that would alarm the uh, the security staff at that point. Okay. So, and then this is the this is the entrance to the balcony. If you're, I'm trying to see if this makes any noise. If you bang, I guess you could you could bang this a little bit and make noise. I'm thinking of the neighbors what right, they might have right. heard. Deputy Chief uh, Cleet Hyman was at a, a it was next door. Was he at the cabin this way or this way? If you know. I believe he's in the cabin this way. All right. Walls? How are, how are these walls? Pretty stacked. Pretty solid. Good. You good sound hear. insulation. You can hear. You can hear through them. If somebody is loud and there's a loud noise in one cabin, it can be heard into the other cabin. Now, um, Cleet said he thought he heard furniture being moved around at some point. This is pretty, is this all bolted down? No, this table's loose. Um, the sofa's loose, but it's, uh, I don't think you, if I was to move the sofa, I don't think it creates a lot of, a lot of noise. Uh, uh, these tables here are loose, uh, but again, moving them isn't, uh, is it a noisy affair? So if you wanted to bang around, move furniture, it's, it's theoretically possible that you could make some noise. Theoretically possible? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I you may, so. you bang if you really, if if you you really went at it, uh, I suppose you could. But I think just normal moving of furniture is something that uh, doesn't create a lot of noise. He heard parting. Sound, he actually, it, it, the way he described it, it sounded like a little bit like a drinking game or something. Mm. Um, uh, I guess we should, I mean, we could probably test to see how loud you have to be. Um, but uh, it is close quarters on these cabins. That it is. That it is. So you can hear a lot going on. So I guess if this is the balcony, um, this is typical furniture, just two chairs. Two chairs. Um, if I wanted to go to someone else's balcony, I could, I could get there. I could yeah, try it. Right. I might and, fall. And the neighbor, the neighbor, well, if you, so you certainly can look over. And right. I believe that's what the neighbor did. Mr. Hyman uh, did the following morning when but, he has stated that when he looked over, uh, he did not notice anything unusual in the um, in the Smith's cabin. Uh, and you could actually sort of look. I mean, he, the one thing he said is he could actually look in here. Right. Turn around and look in here. So he would have. He could turn around and see. I think he said he looked into the bedroom. Correct. And didn't. Uh, and he said it was messy or something like messy, that. Messy, but nothing nothing out of the ordinary in terms of the cabin being uh, in disarray. All right. So railing's pretty high. Um, Okay, and I think he also said that he saw a chair close to the, uh, he saw a, ch a chair close to this, but... Uh, yeah, the actual position of the chair, and again, I'm not at liberty to speak about that, but the chairs were on the, on the balcony. But you could even bump it. I mean, the, the, even the location of the chair doesn't really mean much, right. so even it's easy to move. What's your estimate of the size of this balcony? Uh, it's 41 square feet. So that, uh, but four feet by about 
10, is it there? Something like that. Something like yeah. that, okay, good. Um, and the, uh, this I imagine is a, a pretty standard sized balcony rail. Yes, it is, and it's, it's, it's quite wide on the top, and it's, uh, I believe, one, we gave you that number, I believe it's one meter and 20 uh, from the deck. All right. Um, and is that, uh, is that, are there light, what is this, just a, a deck This is, this is a, actually just an aesthetic structure. It's a, it's a steel canopy that's simply covering the tops of the lifeboats so that when you're standing here looking, enjoying the ocean, Instead of looking down at the top of a yellow lifeboat, you're looking at a, at a white canopy. So it's basically a cosmetic thing. The, the canopy a is a, yes, a, cosmetic, a cosmetic, cosmetic thing. Um, and about how far down is that? that uh, it's seven meters, seven meters from here, from the top of the railing. Right. How many balconies up above us? One more. And then how many balconies below us? Two more. So we're on the third level here. So is that bottom balcony f uh, flush with the canopy? Yeah, it is. I think if you look off to the side there, you can see that it's actually, the deck is a little bit below the canopy in fact. And that's the end of the decks at that point, that's or the end of the, the balconies, the balcony rather. Decks. The end of the balconies right. at that point. Coming up, the cruise line says George Smith's cabin was sealed when the ship left Turkey, but another guest claims he saw a crew cleaning that cabin the days after George disappeared. Who's right? We'll tell you. And later, four men partied with the honeymooners that night. We'll talk to the cruise official who interviewed them. This could be key. Did he believe their stories? He'll tell you.
We are live in Miami tonight with a tour of the cruise ship and the cabin that honeymooner George Smith disappeared from. Witnesses on the cruise say they heard loud noises coming from the Smith's cabin in the very wee hours of July 5. So the best that we can piece together, Cleet Hyman um, is staying in this in cabin, this which cabin. is adjacent to uh, the Smith cabin Correct. next door. Um, and at some point he pounds on it because he mm -hmm. hears noise and that seems to set to settle down the noise. He makes a phone call about 4.05 a.m. to security. And at some point he said that he stuck his head out the door. Right. Um, and it's a little bit confusing, but he stuck his head out the door and saw three people um, in the hall. Do you know um, if, uh, I mean, it, any chance that that's your security people checking because, you know, this is, they found Jennifer and now they're knocking on the door? Or are these likely the three or, or people who are inside no, this the room? Is, this is 405, so this is 25 minutes before we've actually uh, located Jennifer. But it's also after his call, too. So he made the 405 call. Any chance that the people well, the he saw in the hall? the came up to check yeah. his noise complaint? Yeah, any chance that those are the people he saw in the hall? I don't believe, again, from his, uh, his statement, I believe he described them as, as guests, not, not crew members. And it isn't until about what time that now suddenly uh, the ship's on alert that there may be an issue? Okay, it's 8.30 in the morning, two hours after the ship docked in Kushidasi, the two guests uh, looking over their balconies saw on the canopy what they thought was a, a, a spot of blood. Are they people on this floor or another floor? Do you I'm, know? I'm another not really camp? sure good or exactly okay. where they were. Uh, and but they reported it to the ship. Uh, the ship's security was immediately on site. Uh, the ship's captain, in fact, was uh, at the canopy at 8.40, 10 minutes later, and uh, looked at it, wasn't 100% sure it was blood, but thought it was sufficiently <laughs> looked like blood that uh, he sealed the area off. All right, here's uh, cabin 9052. Why is this significant? Who was in here? Well, it's significant. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Sandler uh, had this cabin, and the reason it's significant that on one of the national programs, uh, I believe two days ago, uh, they were interviewed and they said that uh, they were queried as to how many cabins away the Smiths was from theirs and they said we were four cabins away from the Smiths. And the reason that's important is they went on to say that after the fifth and sixth when we have said the cabin, well, the Smiths cabin was secure, that they had seen that the cabin was open and that there was cleaning personnel in the cabin. Mm -hmm. The problem with that is that the Smith's cabin is five cabins away. Right, so let's count them. So we have, here's 9052, right. so here's number one here's is... number one. 554, 2, 56, right. 3 is 58, 58. 4 is 60. 4 is 60. So and this, this, is is the, this is the door that would have been open. They, were, they would have seen people cleaning, and that's completely normal because this was occupied by other guests and not the Smiths. The Smiths cabin is the next one. All right. And, and you say then, and the Royal Caribbean has said that uh, this cabin was secured for, uh, for a number of days. Correct. But, but also, at the, no one, the Turkish authorities hadn't asked you to secure it, or the FBI, no, had they? So no. this was something voluntarily that... Completely that, voluntary. Uh, why, did you, why did you secure it if you were not obliged to? I, I just think we felt that was the appropriate thing to do. And the captain also, as we've talked, had hesitated to even clean the canopy. But it was only when he saw that people had became quite a center of attention for the ship. People were leaning over their balconies. He was afraid that somebody might climb down actually onto the canopy, even though, as you saw, it says no access. Uh, to get a closer look. So um, it was only because of safety concerns that he hosed off the canopy, but we felt it was just appropriate to, um, to keep the cabin secured. And that was good because on the 7th, two days later when the ship was in Piraeus, uh, Greece, uh, the FBI again came on board and investigated the cabin. When you say secure, just locked, or did you have tape on it? I mean, uh, what does it mean to secure the It was the locked. The, it, was, it was locked. There are a uh, very limited number of master keys on board the vessel. Uh, each cabin, as any hotel room, has its own, its own key. So it was after the investigation was completed, the cabin was returned to, uh, to our control by the Turkish police, saying that it's yours, you can do with it as you please, we're finished. Um, it, it was locked. Up until that point, when the Turkish police came on board, we had a posted guard outside. Right. Clean people have that master key, so I mean, even if you, even though it's secure in your mind, clean people could have gotten in there? Yes, okay. clean people could have gotten in, All right. but didn't. All right. So um, you learn about 8.30 in the morning, there's been blood, so all of a sudden, I mean, you mean Royal Caribbean, uh, it's now the uh, cruise line is called into action mm -hmm. to find out if someone's missing. You, you discover someone is missing. Right. How did you discover that? Well, we, the captain immediately made the observation. He has what looks like blood. He has four decks of balcony cabins directly above the canopy that somebody could have fallen from one of the balconies. 
So he immediately started investigating the, the cabins that were directly over the stain, and also the two rows of cabins on either side. Again, the ship had been docked for two hours. Guests had been going ashore for about an hour and a half. We have a very sophisticated access system that allows us to...